Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we are here for the Zebrafish uh, Neural Circuits, Neurophysiology and Behavior um, session. Uh, as you know, the, the zebra, this meeting actually was, uh, and is still called Zebrafish Genetics and Development, uh, has been like this since 1994. But in the last 10 years, there's been a real expansion of the field into um, you know, a kind of projects that don't focus on genes and don't focus on development where the fundamental unit is the neuron or the brain. And uh, it's great to see so many of, of you here for this, uh, for this session on circuits, physiology, and behavior. So the first speaker is uh, Michelle Ma, and she will talk about neuronal connectivity analysis of wild type and mutant zebrafish with transsynaptic virus and 3D brain mapping. Thank you, Alex. And good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the conference committee and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. Um, I'm Michelle from the Penn Lab at Medical College of Georgia, Augusta University. And our lab is interested in the um, complex connectivity patterns, um, connectivity patterns among the neurons and how these patterns are established during development. So the title for today's talk is Neuronal Connectivity Analysis of Wild Type and Mutant Zebrafish Using Transsynaptic Virus and 3D Brain Mapping. Okay, so um, neural circuit development is important in neuroscience. Um, many neurological diseases have developmental causes, um, particularly defects in neuronal connections. Take autism, for example, um, this figure demonstrates the potential effects of network connectivity patterns on the brain activation in non-autistic group versus the autistic group. The network on the left shows a selective global long-range connectivity constituted of local groups, whereas on the right, there is more local connectivities um, but rare on um, long-range connectivities. Um, so um, this macroscopic um, connective changes is likely the result of microscopic um, connectivity changes. So this brings us to realize the importance of understanding how connectivity patterns are established during um, the synaptic um, connection level. To address the question of how connectivity patterns are established at such microscopic scale level during development, we use the zebrafish as our tool. And we know that the zebrafish has unique advantages such as small size, um, translucent brain, relative simplicity, um, and powerful genetics. And together, um, they make the zebrafish an ideal vertebrate model to investigate normal and pathological brain functions. However, even with those advantages, it is still challenging for us to map out the myriad of connections among neurons and identify synaptic level connectivity changes during development or diseases. We recently discovered the transsynaptic virus, such as the vesicular stomatitis virus, known as the VSV, could infect the zebrafish neurons enterogratly and label connecting neurons um, effectively so that it will give a direct visualization of how much connectivity there is, where connections are made, and what cell types are connected so that we can potentially pave a way for um, rapid brain mapping. By combining the viral transsynaptic virus and the zebrafish, we could further reveal the changes to connectivity caused by candidate disease genes. So here's how our viral tracing works in quantitatively mapping the retinal afferent output connect, um, connectivity pathway. We inject the virus to the fish eye at four days post-fertilization, and after 24 hours, um, we fix the fish and um, use immunohistochemistry to stain them with three colors, the green for the virus, 
um, the red for GABA and blue for later aligning with um, a reference brain. So um, we can see here, um, that is the, the fish that we imaged. And after that, um, we put the fish in the, uh, sorry, um, after that we put the fish in the tissue, tissue clearance solution and they imaged it at one micron by, by one micron by two microns. And um, as we see here, the virus traveled from the eye, that's where the injection site was, and it traveled through the optic tract, then to um, the optic chiasm, then finally reached the um, optic tectum, um, where the downstream targets of retinal ganglion cells are congregated. After imaging, we morphed and registered the images for normalization to a reference brain. To a reference brain um, using the blue channel. And we counted all the neurons that's been labeled by the virus. And then we used the coasting of the GABA um, um, to look at what the um, overlapping um, neurons are. So we have this, the GABA neurons and the non-GABA neurons. Those were being labeled by the virus. Then we used the Zebrin 3D brain mapping toolbox for indicating the viral tracer regions. Since we made the initial injection to the eye, and most of the infected neurons should label some of the previously reported retinal afferent pathways, such as the 10 retinal recipient brain regions, including within the optic tectum, the pretectum, the thalamus, the preoptic area, and the accessory optic system. And as a matter of fact, we see here that the zebrin is um, informative enough to give us um, the confidence to further uh, extend the research to look at the neuronal development of candidate genes and neuronal connectivity. We can see here, in line with the previous research, the vast majority of axons terminated in the optic tectum, as seen here. With these applications, we are able to reveal the changes of connectivity caused by candidate disease genes. One of the um, interesting in the pan lab is the DSKM L1 mutant, um, which belongs to the family of DSKM. So um, DSKM is short for Down syndrome cell addition molecules. The mutations in DSKM, DSKM1, L1 have been identified in the individuals, individuals with autism spectrum disorders. And our goal is to look into how the DSKM family genes affect the visual connectivity. And we find that DSKM mutants have an overall GABA and non-GABA connectivity um, reduction comparing with those found in the wild types. So um, by counting all the virus labeled cells that we could quant quantify the amount of neurons that's being um, labeled and connected. We also find different genotypes of fish from the same parents showing different amount of excitatory and inhibitory um, neurons in the same anatomical brain region. Um, take a look at the asterisk here. Um, they show that the SKM L1 mutant fish has significantly lower number of virus label excitatory neurons infected in the optic tectum. We also um, um, think that, you know, since there is um, morphological um, difference, there might be um, some difference in behavior that we could actually identify. So since the viral labeling results depicted less connectivity in the optic tectum in mutants, and it's known that the optic tectum is homologous to the mammalian superior colliculus, which directs the eye movement, we hypothesize that the reduced connectivity could potentially affect saccadic eye movements in the DSKML1 mutants. So um, in order to test our hypothesis, we use the optokinetic response assay. The optokinetic response, or the OKR, is an innate behavior elicited by moving black and white stripes or gratings. And the animal with fixed head follow the stripes visually to stabilize the image on the retina.
So um, in the saccadic eye movement experiment, we focused on the spontaneous and fast resetting saccades. Here we see while there are stimul no stimulus on the screen, which is this one. Um, in the wall types, we see there are spontaneous and it's relatively regular spikes that's going on while there are like, no stimulus. But look at the mutant fish. Um, there might be random spikes or weaker spikes. And during the stimulus in the wild types, we find that they have a fast resetting that's also similar. But uh, I mean, fast resetting that's also pretty regular. But in the DSKML ones, you see the resettings, they might be um, big ones or the small ones. And towards the end, there seemed to be a fatigue um, in the resettings. Um, so um, here, I won't go too deep into the DSKML1 behavior and um, also just the DSKML ones, because we're also doing um, other uh, genetic lines that um, uh, related with the virus work. Um, but we do have a poster at Z6212B this afternoon, starting 1.30. And this work is presented by my colleague, Tom Wan, uh, who is also on the DSKM L1 um, project with me. So we both will be there. And if you have any questions, we'll be very glad to answer all of them. So to wrap up my talk for today, we know that the viral transsynaptic labeling and 3D brain mapping provide quantitative readout of visual connectivity. And that the zebrafish model investigating genetics, neural circuitry, and behavior roles of disease genes is very promising. So that we'll have a complete story from genes to circuits, then to behavior. And for the line that we're studying right now, the DSKML one, um, the DSKML one gene is required for tactile connectivity and saccadic eye movements. And here I like to thank um, all the people from the pan lab. Um, they're a group of amazing people, and um, our facility um, managers and um, supervisors for their great work, and also our um, collaborators from Harvard University and Harvard Medical School. And thank you all for your time. So, nice, nice technology. I was a bit confused, so you showed um, connections to the telencephalon from the retina? Excuse so me? You showed connections of retinal ganglion cells to the telencephalon uh, on your slide? Th there, just one second. This would be a first in any vertebrate. Um, yes, there's some connections that, um, like some neurons that actually landed in there. So yeah, I guarantee you that's an artifact. Okay, um, yeah, we can talk that about that um, after the talk. Uh, we just counted the, 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 the neurons that's being um, labeled and we used the, the, the Z-brain. So um, the readout, we're still working on like to actually specify the regions more into more detailed, but um, that's the readout that we got, so yeah just to be um, pretty um, objective, I just have it up here. But I did show the significance um, for, the, for those neurons. So some of the, since it's a virus that's been spreading, there might be some labels that probably, and, and we know that the virus um, may show some new pathways that we don't know yet, but you know, it takes time to actually um, get the research into more, um, what do you call it, more clarified. So uh, how much variability is there in injecting the virus between one animal to the next, and could some of that account for the differences between the wild type and the mutant? 
excuse me. Could you uh, how much variation do you get? I mean, do you um, get complete labeling of all the retinal ganglion cell bodies? We, and uh, sorry, oh, we inject the virus at um, similar amount, and um, we look through all of them. They seem to have like in all the wild types and all the mutants and all the heterozygous. They seem to have um, similar amounts. So we actually quantified that in um, in our um, pilot research. So the amount is pretty stable, and the amount of labeling is also stable. And have you tried injecting other tissue? Do you need to have a vesicle or some kind of a space where you can confine the virus, or can you inject in other places of the brain too? You can also inject other places, um, because we, use the, we study the visual system, so uh, we inject it from the eye so that we can actually um, have a, a reference from previous research. Thank you.